Hey all, welcome back to the channel. I'm, I'm struggling a bit, I'll explain why, but you'll all remember from uh, from a couple of months ago, actually probably longer than that now, but I was diagnosed with a heart condition and uh, every now and then it just goes a bit funny and now it <laughs> now happens to be one of those times. But um, I've come out here to the crow's nest past and, and you, you'll see it in a bit but behind me here is crow's nest mountain and I've just come out me and Jip are going to have a cup of coffee well I'm going to have a cup of coffee but um, uh, what turned out to be what was going to be a, a quite a, a pleasant and easy going sort of filming session has <laughs> turned out to be a bit of a drama really because I've come out here into one of the parking places which is uh, the road that I want to go up is closed they close it at certain times of year because avalanches and stuff and uh, and so I couldn't go where I wanted to go which is a bit further up but um, I parked here in, in what they call the staging area it's kind of an area where people can park up and and go for walks and use the skidoos or whatever they call them and uh, it's normally well it is well kept as you can see there's been a big machine here through to squash it all down but right behind where the camera is is a nice little clearing in trees and I thought wouldn't it be nice if I could just park in clearing and I'll set up camera and it'll all be jolly nice anyway <laughs> as you can perhaps see by these things here these ruts here and I'll show you a photograph of it but uh, we might have just have buried Ranger over earlier on <laughs> right, get one RB out here for shovel it out that's why Max tracks are um, are out, and you'll see you'll see photographs of those. Well, what happened was because we're in spring, top half at, um, at grounds very frozen. I've been I've walked all over here before I came round, and it was quite solid anyway. By the time I got two and a half ton a Range Rover sat on top of it, it wasn't very solid at all. <laughs> I've got to fill up me uh, fill up me jet boil. Um. Anyway. I've dug rain over out and get him out with Max tracks. But he's made me out go a bit 10 100 at the moment and I'm I'm just struggling a bit for breath. But I, I'm going to record video because you'll have to just see when I show you drone footage. I've sent drone up, but running short out when you're out in mountains, even though they've put clocks back here in Canada or forwards. Uh, sun soon disappears behind mountains and then you're in dark and then it's a bit of a drama um, so I've come out here and I've come out and record a couple of videos uh, hopefully I'll have time for doing both but it's been a bit of a rough well it's been a rough 18 months really on and off because uh, as you know Tara and I split up which was a pretty rough do and then I lost my income stream in separation which was a <laughs> another drama uh, and then last week my dad died uh, so this week coming up I've got to fly back to the UK and and, uh, and and sort that out well not sort it out but do some stuff with my mum so uh, it's been a bit of a, a rough do and this past three months I haven't had any chance to record any video because I've actually been um, on my thesis doing my actual job and I've been extraordinarily busy and I've had uh, I bet I've spent 20 hours a day at the computer and we haven't really had a chance to do anything which is why there's no photographs on me my Facebook or my Instagram or anything because it's just been it's just been a rough time anyway uh, there's two things I want to tell you actually there's going to be two videos but in this video I want to tell you two things the first thing is the reason that I'm not still sat in this hole uh, generally fed up and I, I did bury it and you'll probably see I've turned Ranger over around but you'll probably see that it's in, super, in extended mode uh, what some folks call super extended mode but that's not true it's just extended mode and it's sat here because um, I actually buried it I buried it properly I, I couldn't see top of well it fell through a, the top of the snowpack uh, and I didn't really get out and have a look to see how deep it were I just put it in low range and tried to back out and dug a couple of big holes uh, so I actually sat it on the on the belly plate so it was very flat <laughs> in fact you can see some at marks here at belly plate um, and the reason I'm not sat in this hole here is because I carry with me all throughout the winter uh, as you might have seen 
in my earlier videos these Max tracks, the Mark II Max tracks, and uh, and just behind Jip here is a is a is a tote full of all manner of stuff. Uh, one of which is actually a uh, it's an old actually it's an old poncho from the German military or something or other, but it folds out into a tent and you can use it as a ground sheet. Uh, and so that's sort of what I've done. I've, I've sort of lay on it while I've dug Range Rover out with best one RB and uh, that's why I'm a bit out of breath and art's gone a bit funny because art doesn't like me doing that much sort of exciting work and I've just stopped and we're going to have a cup of coffee so one of the things I wanted to tell you is that uh, when and if you do come out somewhere like this and if you are in somewhere nice like Canadia and you can come out to the mountains which we do quite a lot it is extremely important to carry with you some things that will enable you to get unstuck if you happen to be stuck. Now this is a staging area and there are some other vehicles kicking about quite a way away. Uh, happened about a mile away, I drove past them all the way up here and I haven't heard them start up again so I'm assuming they're still here but um, the point of this conversation is that uh, uh, if I hadn't got this tackle I am probably about 12 mile away from nearest town and I'd have footy to get there to get somebody else to come and, and, and tow me out or something so it's quite it's quite a long drag is what I'm trying to tell you and so I've got this tackle and these are just bare essentials to carry with me a, a one RB a shovel and uh, two max tracks and some blankets and oh here's that here's the poncho look and I just carry this as a ground sheet blankets and some other things you've seen me eat E, me winter EDC and, and uh, oddly enough this is a perfect example of why you actually need it come away from that fire you um, now the second thing the, the actual point of this video uh, is I wanted to chat to you about I, I had a, I've had a number of, of messages and comments on my Facebook channel and they're all very good and I've tried my best to reply to them even though I haven't been actually sort of about my business uh as much as i should be and um and and so i have replied to him but a, a number of them have been about how do i pick you know what's normal for a range rover how do i pick a good one and you know what kinds of things do i need to to look out for and all these sorts of things and and, and so this short video <laughs> depending on some this short video is going to be about um about how do i pick a range rover well uh, so i'm going to split this up into what i what i would consider to be the three the three groups of the l322 so you've got the uh the the very early edition which was 2003 stroke four lie down pal 2003 three stroke four and then uh, and then you've got a big change around 2006 to 2009 what they call a, a facelift uh, and then they've got another one uh, 2010 to 2012 one of the downsides with picking out snow is you pine needles in it I'm going to have a piney coffee chip um, so the, those are the three eras right you get the the early era and then at 2006 they start to drop the AJV8 in it a Jaguar engine prior to that the uh, the Range Rovers came with uh, with a, a BMW diesel or a BMW petrol and the BMW petrol engine isn't actually a bad lump to be honest um, but for lots of complicated reasons JLR decided to put in the wrong thermostat and it cooks them cooks all the ancillaries and so you you do tend to find uh, unless you change the stat you get quite a few temperature related problems and alternator problems because the alternator's water <laughs> water cooled why well, they thought that was a good idea i don't know but anyway um <clears throat> so you got all these water related issues as a function of the, the 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 thermostat being set quite high for efficiency but of course that creates other issues such as premature gasket failure and all these all, all the sorts of things uh, now the vehicle's quite old-fashioned now being 2005 of course uh 2003 4 5 um and so the technology on the inside is quite dated and the, the infotainment screen is is not the best and uh it does have some you know it's got all the electric windows and and i think they've got heated seats all round and 
uh, maybe not in back but certainly in front and and so in terms of creature comforts in cab they, they are a little bit less refined um, they also have a chocolate gearbox uh, a five speed box that was mated to the 4.4 litre BMW lump which is a nice engine and actually having driven the five speed box it's quite nice to drive too they actually sound a lot better because I don't know who tuned the, the, the exhaust for um, uh, for uh, for that but uh, they made a better job than they did on the 2010s and 2009s and, and so on so they actually sound a lot better and they're quite nice to drive they're not shy of power by any stretch of your imagination even though they're not supercharged um they didn't have a more advanced suspension system this has got adaptive suspension and, and that came out in 2009 i think uh so the the earlier bm what we'll call the bmw iteration the generation one first gen range rover that came out uh uh, with no adaptive suspension although it did have you know electronic air suspension with a little knob on dashboard and that's not so bad but the knob does throw a few, a few faults from time to time and the bags aren't quite as reliable as the system we have now and the, the compressor's not quite as good either so when they get a little older you do start having some compressor related issues and and so on and so forth um, but uh, all told it's not actually a terrible uh, a terrible drivetrain in terms of reliability smaller brakes fitted out with 18 inch wheels and if you are one of those 18 inch off-road wheel groupies and you, you perhaps know my thoughts on those I don't really see the point in them um, you can I've never damaged a rim in my life I let a lot of 20 inch or 18 inch hotels and I've, I've off-roaded fairly harsh haven't we pal yes we've been about haven't we um, you go roll over into that stove and then there'll be hot dog and hot water everywhere um, so you can put them on but that means they've got smaller brakes which makes them a little bit more susceptible to, to uh, eat fade and, and warping on the brakes um, uh, but you know they, they, all in all they're not a bad thing like like most of the early Range Rovers and most of the older Range Rovers the headlinings and things will start to, to fragment and you will get uh, ingress of water in certain areas that can fry some of the little modules so if the parking sensors and electric windows don't work and things like that there's a good chance you've had water ingress in it So there can be related issues to uh, to water ingress and you know uh, uh, some drama like that, uh, and, and those kinds of faults are not extremely complicated to fix, but they're quite difficult to locate, if that makes sense. So they can, they can be quite challenging to identify. Uh, of course, the the uh, the radio system and infotainment system is not the best, and if the screen disappears. Um, and the pixels you know the liquid crystal display fades uh you you do struggle to ever access any of the uh, mileage functions and the the vehicle computer and all these sorts of things however one of the benefits of the older models is that they do feel a bit more organic i have a pal up in calgary and he's got one he, and he prefers driving his than the 2010 that he's got um and you can change the edge unit in them there are a number of options that you can buy from aliexpress and, and other places that are uh, an android exchange so you can get google play and all of that kind of stuff and, and that really does fancy them up a bit uh, but i don't think you can retain 
on all of the various infotainment systems I don't think you can retain the computer system so you do lose access to your trip computer and your fuel economy and all that kind of stuff uh, I've owned one in the past a 2005 a silver one and it was in pretty good shape uh, and I really liked it uh, but it, the lack of technology sort of irritated me a bit and over time when they get a little older um, the the leathery bits on the door cards and things like that start to stretch and wrinkle and they become a bit they become a bit sort of not tatty but a bit saggy around the ears if you see what I mean a bit bag pussy um, and that's a bit of a drama when you're trying to uh, you know have a nice car or whatever but they are quite a cheap option now you can buy them over here if you can find a nice one for six or seven grand but you might just have to throw quite a bit of money into fiddling about with the with the transmission or the engine or the alternator when the alternators go it's a, it's a good fifteen hundred dollars for a new alternator because they're all water cooled and they're a bit of a drama really but anyway so um so that's a, that's the thing you need to sort of remember with them uh what else have i got to tell you well, well the the undercarriage of them does suffer a little bit from rust as if you live in those areas where there is such a thing uh, we, we're all right here in alberta because we don't get a lot of precipitation but it can be quite rough um on the on the subframe and various bits and bobs uh so you, you do need to check them for you know related rust items especially in the wheel arches and the bottom of the spare wheel uh, carrier and things like that uh, so if you do go and have a look at one and you are interested in it then you know make sure you try and find one with full service history and all that kind of thing um, and uh, and preferably have a you know get it up on a ramp somewhere so you can poke it with a screwdriver and see if there's any any rust on the subframe or, or any of that kind of stuff um, so uh, that's what I have to say about that the transmission no actually I'll just finish one more thing on those things the transmission uh, is a bit of chocolate um, and so if it start if it if it's a bit slushy between some of the gears or if it doesn't hold onto the gears or if it doesn't feel right when you're driving it you probably either won't walk away from it or be mindful that you'll be rebuilding the transmission um, especially if the guy that's or well, the person that's had it looks like they might have just thrashed it about, <laughs> thrashed it about a bit um, but anyway that's that's the 2005 they are an, a nice car a nice vehicle uh and in silver in particular i think they look a bit sharp really but anyway so then in 2006 uh, jlr threw their uh, ajv8 engine in it which was a 4.2 liter supercharged or a 4.4 liter naturally aspirated and i think about that time you could probably in the UK if you're lucky enough to live somewhere that has um, a diesel uh, I think you can start getting the TDV8s uh, I'm not sure about that because living here for the last 20 years I'm not sure when they came out but anyway you upgraded the box at that time as well so 2006 you updated the box to a, a, Z8, a, a ZF uh, ZF ZF that's it ZF HP 26 you start getting that box in in the supercharged uh, and the lower rated box of the same type in the in the naturally aspirated uh, the box is is a bit stronger but it does t still suffer from servicing related issues and and you should be mindful that if the box hasn't had a service by about hundred thousand it's probably a bit too late to save it long like forever uh, and the first thing you should be looking at is a full transmission service preferably with a, a flush if you can find one um we don't have anywhere that does them over here because canada um anyway uh, so you get the new box and you get the new engine and along with all of that you get a bit of a new infotainment system that sort of landed in 2005 and that updated that a bit but in 2006 it gets a few more toys uh, and you start getting slightly better technological advances inside you get automatic uh, rain sensing wipers and, and other such delightful things um, and uh, the, the, obviously the drivetrain's a bit better I think they threw some new airbags on and some new brakes and rotors on it as well so they start getting the the, the bigger Brembros and, and uh, they most likely come out with 19 inch rims at that time and 20 were an option uh, 
you get some different tech in the tailgate. The tailgate is ever so slightly different. Um, and inside the interior, there's a number of different seat interiors. I shall mention this before I get onto the next one because I will forget. But uh, there was a slight, there was a, a facelift again between the 2006 and 2007, and you got a different seat option. And by all accounts, that seat in the 2007 to 2009 which has 16-way controls, is about your best seat option of, of the lot uh, for comfort, so I'm, so I'm told. And about 2007, you started to get air-cooled air seats, or 2008, but anyway, around there, you started to get heated and cooled uh, seats with this 16-way uh, seat thing that was a bit more comfortable, really, uh, on and off. And... Uh, and you got a few other things, you got a different level of trim and you got, you know, the seat design's obviously different, you got a little bit more technology, you get, you start to get uh, 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 technology available on, on the later 2009s such as adaptive cruise control and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. I think the late 2009s come with adaptive cruise control as an option. Uh, and there's a bunch of other different options that you can find including cameras on the late 2009s but I might be wrong that might be 2010 but so what I'm saying is that between 2005 and 2009 there's, there's a quite a lot of changes that happen on different years and obviously the later the later model you buy the, the more technological advances it has on it uh, but broadly speaking the the drivetrain and, and stuff for the for the range from 2006 on roughly remains the same uh, with this AJV8 uh, lump in it and uh, supercharged or not and um, uh, and the big Z ZF uh, transmission um, the six speed um, which is good now you can on the 2000 and five onwards you can fit flappy paddles but it's a bit of a it's a bit of an headache it's not a simple job like the one i did on mine and and uh, there's a couple of people in the um the range rover community online on facebook and whatever that, that have done a number of different variations of, of how you do that um matt stevenson's one of them and, and, and so he's got some videos out there that'll show you pretty much how to do that but it's not as simple as what i did um, on those earlier range, you can also change the uh, um, you can also change the edge unit. It's a little bit more complicated on those later models, and you have to spend a bit more coin and get some gear from um, from either Australia or uh, Samuel's got a, a video out on a, on a new uh, head unit for the 2010 onwards 2010 onwards uh, and that's a nice unit as well and apparently it's a little bit better than the one from Australia but um, anyway there are some options to change that because even when you get to 2010 the the infotainment system does feel a bit dated by today's standards I mean it's 12 years old um, so you have difficulty with Bluetooth integration and things like that so uh, you get a slight update on the suspension system so you get a different anti-roll bar uh, system on the on the 2006s that gives you better roll performance in the corners uh, you get different air suspension system and a different air compressor uh, which is a little bit better uh, better cooling so it's a little bit better for towing uh, and then of course in in 2009 and 2000 2009 to 2012 there's quite a big change the facelift model the the third generation facelift model of the L322 has quite a lot of differences in it between that and the the previous generation um in terms of, of not just road train but also uh drive sorry not just drive line but also uh, the the uh, suspension and infotainment system so you get the 5 litre uh, Range Rover the 5 litre AJV8 direct injection engine which is a bit tappy because it's direct injection so it's, it's quite noisy um, but the this sound deadening that the uh, that Range Rover fit um, is, is vastly improved to the 2005 2006 so even though the engine's noisier they're actually a, a quieter vehicle by quite some stretch really um, 
the engine becomes this five litre option you can get a five litre supercharged or a five litre naturally aspirated um, or you can get the uh, uh, the various versions of the TDV8 um, in such countries that aren't North America uh, and if you have the option I would heartily recommend that you get the 4.4 over the 3.6 it's a it's a more robust longer lived uh, bigger built stronger gearbox attached to it still the ZH ZF HP 26 but it's a bigger transmission um, and so it's it's built differently than the one that fits the 5 litre naturally aspirated um, and is shared by the the 5 litre supercharged in virtue of the extra <laughs> the extra oomph um, so then you get a, a better interior, slightly redesigned dashboard, uh, they, they've moved some of the things around from, as they did on the 2007, they moved some of the things around on the dashboard so that the interior looks sharper. Uh, you get piano black options if you're so inclined for that sort of thing. Um, but on 2010 or 2009 I think you start to lose the 16 way seats in preference for the 14 way seats which don't have massages in them and, and apparently are not quite as comfortable as the um, as the, uh, the the 16 way that preceded them I've never had a 2007 so I can't tell you I jumped directly from a 2005 into a 2011 and then into into this a 2010 and there are a number of things on this one that aren't the same as my 2011 even though this is an uh, autobiography it doesn't have uh, surround cameras it, it has the rear um, entertainment system and, and a bunch of other stuff um, but it's still missing some of the some of the toys that my 2011 had so when you go and look at them it's not just enough to go and buy an autobiography because of course the autobiographies are a sort of a entry level autobiography spec if that makes sense uh, and you can specify things on them from there on but you could also buy what is known over here as an hse or a supercharged which is a level of specification and and then you can add things to that spec in the UK and elsewhere they're Vogue's and Vogue SE's and the Vogue SE's are below the autobiography but you can still add stuff to that that turns it into something perhaps better than autobiography and to be honest having owned an autobiography sorry I don't mean to tell you this but uh, having owned an autobiography uh, the leather in the headlining and the uh, uh, sun visors can squeak from time to time in a way that's incredibly irritating uh, and so my advice if you can get it is to get the the black either the black suede liner headliner from the um, very nice Westminster's uh, or Velvet or whatever they want to call it uh, or the black or the black one I'm not a fan of these light coloured ones but that's only because I <laughs> throw all manner of junk in it and you end up marking all these plastic panels and so on and so forth so I would you know have a look about and, and various different colour options and colour interiors provide different colours for the, the roof and the tailgates and, and you know all these plastic bits um, my the benefit of the 2010 2009 to 2012 is that you get uh, a vast increase in in handling because they come with uh, or at least most of them come with the uh, adaptive suspension which is um, a ferrous uh, filled fluid like it's got iron filings in it and uh, they've got a big electromagnet affair that helps stop the roll in the corners uh, it does increase the 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 road feel significantly it makes them a bit more harsh um, but it also means that they perform significantly better than the previous models to the extent that I would not entertain an older model now you'd lose that organic feeling um, because of course uh, well the organiciness is not there anymore because it's, it's altered by these uh, ferrous oxide things the other thing I should mention about this is if you're buying a 2010 uh, or 2009 depending upon the mileage you should be you should be thinking about changing the shock absorbers all around because shock absorbers have a lifetime uh, and the electronic part of that shock absorber um, means that they don't perform quite as well when they're a bit older I haven't done mine yet but when I did my 2011 it had fairly high mileage when I bought it and I, and I hung around a bit before one of the shocks started to leak but then I changed all four of them when the first one started to fail 
and the difference in road handling was quite significant. Anyway, uh, they uh, they really do make a massive difference to the to the the vehicle. Um, so in terms of in terms of what vehicle would I suggest you buy, I'm always going to suggest you buy a late model. I love the five liter supercharge. I've had a lot of problems with the 4.4 naturally aspirated, which are generally understood as being the most reliable lump. But I've had lots of problems with the one that I had fitted in my LR3. Um, I didn't have a lot of issues with me my BMW lump, and, and my transmission was all right. But it was a, I suppose you could describe them as a bit of a ticking time bomb. Um, and uh, so I always advise people to go later with the L322 because when they brought out the L405 which followed it in 2013 there was a big shift in the technology but it all went quite austere the L322 is is a better built vehicle I think in terms of robustness and it just feels you know the, the metal's heavier um, it, there are steel parts on the L322 and the L405 does save 500 kilos by um, by moving to aluminium which is, is better in that it doesn't rust so you don't get the rust issues that you do on the tailgate and the top tailgate and the wheel arches and, and so on and so forth but, uh, but they also don't feel quite as rugged somehow they, they feel a bit plasticky and so I've always been a big fan of, of the the L322 because of how it, you know because of how robust it feels. The um, uh, the five liters um, in the 2010 only come with 20 inch rims uh, because they've got big fat Brembos on. You can you can buy the five liter naturally aspirated with a 19 inch rim on it because the brakes are smaller. Uh, one of the benefits of the big the big brakes is that if you tow anything. Um, it really does improve your, your towability and I would recommend moving to green stuff pads if you do tow anything because the the original Land Rover pads tend to <laughs> they tend to cook the rims unfortunately they're not they're not the best pads in the world um, the 2010 has more technology so it does suffer from more technological related dramas and you get more module failures and it hasn't it has an optical fiber uh, moist system in it for the infotainment which means that it's a lot harder to do anything with it and if you do have speaker or amp problems it can be a bit of a nightmare to both diagnose and fix because you can't really fix optical fibers um, cheaply or easily and um, and so you, you can sort of get that so my final piece of advice is that whenever you go to look at a Land Rover Range Rover it's extremely important that you try absolutely everything and that by that i mean the heated windscreen the heated seats the the parking sensors the uppy downy bits the the automatic steps if it's got them the the rain sensing windshield if it's got it the like the parking lights the backup cat like everything absolutely everything check everything because they do have uh, they do have the capacity to throw you niggling little issues that are actually quite problematic to fix when I bought this, the parking sensor didn't work on the back or the front because it had coded out. But um, the the back parking sensors were fine. It was actually the module it had got water in the module, and the problem with that is that by the time I diagnosed it, which wasn't difficult, finding the part was about five hundred dollars. It was quite pricey, and you can't just go and get one off a wrecker because some of them are VIN coded. So I did actually go and get one off a wrecker, which would have fitted. It was the same part number, but it was VIN coded. The one that I took off wasn't VIN coded, so it sort of depends what the donor vehicle is really. And the one that's been put on, which I had Land Rover do uh, while I was away, um, they fitted a obviously a genuine Land Rover one, but they had to VIN code that before it worked. So some do and some don't. It just depends upon, I guess, minor differences between the modules. The original module, of course, is no longer available, so they they've offered a part a cross reference to new part number but within that new part number is probably some demands for in the in the firmware to be to be VIN coded which is why they, they had to VIN code it but anyway so you get the kind of idea um, so so basically uh, feel free to go on and, and have a look at your, your various Range Rovers and know that in terms of mechanics um, the drivetrain you're probably the most reliable models are 2006 <clears throat> to 2009 in terms of engine and transmission 
uh, and in terms of uh, design and, and infotainment, then the 2010 and 2000, 2009 to 2012 is your, your better option. And then, you know, if you don't have a lot of money but you fancy getting into a Range Rover, because they don't actually look that much different apart from different headlights and some other bits and bobs, um, then, you know, 2003 to 2005 is a, is a, uh, it can be a reliable vehicle depending on what you pick. I should, I should mention the headlights. The 20, 2006 had an upgraded headlight and sometime around 2009, I think, they came out with a little, or well, that might have been 2006, they came out with a little um, electronic like turning headlights and, and if you come and dr drive these roads here, uh, it really is quite in the night time and, and mountain passes that those um, those adaptive headlights are actually quite remarkable because they steer around corners and they point you better even than the Defender by a long stretch um because they they actually turn into the curve and you can see where you're going before you get there if you, if you see what i mean anyway so that's an option and i think uh you know those kinds of those kinds of technological advances is why i chose uh, uh, to go into a 2010 instead of a 2009 there were a couple of 2009s available but i do like this engine the the fuel economy is a significant improvement my lr3 with the 4.4 naturally aspirated managed a total of 11 on a good day uh, and this does 22 24 on a on a good day it averages 20 to 21 around town so so anyway there you go i, I hope that bit of a, a a video has been some use to you and i hope that uh it'll be helpful for those of you that are interested in, in picking up an L322 with some of the things that you need to look for. Um, the final rundown of things that I think you need to be aware of, um, on the 5 litres the, the uh, water pumps tend to fall out at about 75 to 100,000 miles, um, the supercharger isolator also at the same time so you should probably do both the five litre i'm not going to do much on the on the timing chains because i've done an entire video on that but do be mindful that if it hasn't had a timing chain and it is an early model then you might be looking at one or certainly prepare for having to put that in if it must starts making the associated timing chain noise um the viscous fan coupling on the l322 uh, the 2010s is a bit of a problem on the 2006s uh, the the thermostat pipe crossover is a bit of a nightmare um, I had I'm the wrong person to speak to I had everything wrong with mine it it went through five water pumps all genuine all fitted by well one four of them fitted by Land Rover it went through five of those uh, full set of injectors um, crossover pipes thermostats uh, alternators uh, MAF sensors map sensors like it went through everything i had a very bad experience with my 4.4 naturally aspirated and i wouldn't recommend anybody buy one but if you follow the advice on the on the facebook groups and, and the forums then you'll find that they are actually the most reliable uh and then on the early ones like i said uh, you, you have the overheating of the engine issue and the chocolate transmission but um you know it is possible to find good good examples and and keep them on the road um so anyway if that was any good to you thank you very much for liking and subscribing to the video in this uh, I'll, I'll throw in some drone footage so you don't have to <laughs> stare <laughs> stare at me in the back of this car being boring um and uh, i'll see you next time i won't be recording another video for another month at least because i'm going to the uk for the funeral of my father so um uh, it'll be it'll be a bit before I'm, I'm back able to record anything so i'm going to try and throw this out while uh before i go edit it and before i go and then you should have it while i'm gone um do i do thank you for your patience i i know that i've not put out as much content as i normally have but there's i've had a lot of things on and, and it's been a bit of a rough go for me really but anyway thank you very much for tuning in it's been great to speak to you again and we'll see you next time for more of the same cheerio